Hey bear. Can I go outside? Oh, look how beautiful these roses are. So pretty. I got a bunch of a dead heading to do in here. You know, the lovely thing with a cottage garden is, is that this is only going to get more full from here. Like all these different things that go to seed, like I've just been pulling them off and dropping them down. Um, just everything because I want this stuff to reseed in here and fill the space out as you know years go by all right let's step in the greenhouse <laughs> this is the reality of a bes between seasons greenhouse um, super cute so the fans are running so we're not going to stay in here very long so i'm sure it's very loud but um this is like somewhat soon on our priority list not too terribly soon we have this beautiful stained glass tabletop that's going to be a potting bench in here and maya is going to build shelving we just haven't prioritized that one so we don't need it we haven't needed that but two even with the shade cloth and the fans it's still quite hot in here um and our temperatures have heated up some i don't think it's quite as hot as it normally is here because our highs are sitting at like 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius, which is hot, especially when you've got like almost 100% humidity. But it's, I mean, the end of August is usually very, very hot in South Carolina. So um, even still, it it's unbearable to work in here throughout the day. So we're kind of waiting for a break in the temperature to really start working, but we will get this place really reclaimed and potentially grow some things in here over winter, but really be ready in like January to put a little space heater in here and start some seeds for next spring. Y'all, I just came over here to the garden. Here are the freshly dug sunflower graves. <laughs> They're looking less like freshly dug graves now that the sunflowers are actually coming up. Um, Bear is chasing a rodent which he doesn't realize, but I saw it run across here. Oh. Unfortunately, that is the reality of country living. So far, I really haven't had just a ton of like damage that I've really noticed from the rodents, but we'll see what these sweet potatoes look like whenever I dig them up. Got some volunteer squash going on right there. And here are our uh, field peas, our chicken and dumplings peas. Those are the first ones we planted, which we're still harvesting a lot of and I'm shelling regularly. And then I've got a lot more shelling in my future, which I'm not upset about. And the sweet potato patch is very weedy on the front, but here you can see that they've been pretty vigorous and have choked out the weeds. So that multi-headed sunflower is pretty, but look at this one. I can't get too close. I'm not stepping in that without boots on. Isn't that so great? That's amazing, isn't it? beautiful things other notable things in the garden um, here's some nine foot tall okra plants and I'm not exaggerating these actually these actually may be like no they're probably like nine or ten feet one and a half dad's tall I'm five six and I'm standing flat-footed next to these and this is the vantage point that we have this is crazy just absolutely crazy so this is the motherland okra wild massive plants look at this look at these we'll get in here and show you if something crawly falls on me uh, we'll scream together okay look at that it's crazy it feels like a tropical jungle under here all right i've come down here beside my uh what i think we could call the slightly rotten tomato walls and i'm picking some holy basil I'll take it inside and make sweet Maya some tea. I actually came out here for the purpose of getting holy basil to make Maya tea, regular basil um, because I'm making some pizza sauce because I'm making pizza for, for dinner. Um, and I may grab some shishito peppers and blister those to eat before the pizza just because they're prolific and I have lots of them. So. Uh, the thing about eating seasonally is whenever something is in season, you just eat a lot of it. Now, the holy basil, which you guys have heard me reference this multiple times, it's because we're literally making this like 
we make it like every other day. So um, basil tea, my friend Taylor kind of brought this recipe into our house and it's now become a staple. We made a video about it. It's on my blog. I'll show the recipe down below if you've never made this before. I've been asked a lot by people like, hey, could you make this and can it? Could you freeze it? What could you do? I think the best way to like save these herbs to make tea later would be to dry them. So the way you would do that is take a bunch of basil like this, hang it upside down. I like to use pipe cleaners. So like you get them in the craft section, little bendy wire things that are soft. Um, that's what I always hang herbs with because you can wrap them around and then you can kind of like hook them onto something, a curtain rod or, you know, a shelf or something. Well, you could put them on the back of a doorknob. You can hang them easily with a twisty pipe cleaner and then take them off easily so you don't have to fool with finding string or anything like that. Um, so I actually always have a package of pipe cleaners in my junk drawer in my kitchen to hang herbs up. So hanging up a bundle of holy basil like this and then once it's fully dry crumbling it up and storing it in a jar. I had I used to have this thing on my back porch that was like this herb dryer and it was really really cool. It was like a net thing and you could lay things out in like a single row and that was awesome and it had multiple levels uh, but it took up a lot of space so frankly hanging it upside down in bundles you don't want it to be too big because there'd be too much moisture in the inside but bundles like this it dries and it dries well you don't need a dehydrator to dry herbs like this and um, in fact you really don't necessarily want to put herbs like this in a dehydrator unless you have a really nice dehydrator that has a very low setting because you wouldn't want to heat your herbs because then you would be um, potentially damaging them. So yeah, super easy. Uh, and then once they're dried, you would steep them just like you would any other like loose leaf dried tea. You could get um, like a little diffuser thing. Like I have this little metal ball that holds loose leaf tea or you can put them in some sort of like mesh bag or something like that and steep them. Or you could just steep them in the water and strain them out. That also works, but yeah. I've not started drying basil yet because we have such a dang long season that I'll be harvesting fresh basil for at least another two months. Um, but at some point I will start drying this so that I can make this over the winter. Okay. So right here on the inside of the high tunnel, you can see all these little seedlings. These are all um, brassica starts. Now, we planted these whenever it was uh, significantly cooler outside just a couple weeks ago and it has heated back up, but I think it'll be fine. They're under the shade cloth. Right now they're getting the most intense sun that they get all day. The rest of the day, it's really nice. And here, which I'm gonna step in my bed. I tell everybody not to do this. Here are more cool weather seedlings. Again, they're doing okay. Um, it, it's not ideal for it to be this warm but i think it'll be okay for this no longer than it'll be this way so i picked some shishito peppers just as a little appetizer for our pizza night blistered shishitos and i was just noticing that i have a whole bunch of ripe habanadas now i think these are habanadas i'm pretty certain these are habanadas but before i go make something with them i do need to know for sure it is with complete fear that I just bit into this, but it's delicious. It's a habanada. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a bunch of these. Habanadas are like habaneros, but heatless. They have a tiny bit of heat to them if you're very sensitive to heat. I'm talking like very, very little. They are very fruity and delicious. And I'm thinking that I want to take these and mix them with some sugar rush peach peppers that I have and make a hot sauce out of those. So the sugar rush peaches are pretty hot and I'm thinking that if I mix them with these, I'll get more of a tropical flavor while still having some heat. So I'm gonna pick a bunch of these. Well, isn't it crazy the amount of production on one pepper plant? Like, look at this. And these plants got like a stunted puny start and I'm still picking off like so many peppers. It's amazing. Here are the sugar rush peach peppers, which I think they could probably stand to get a little darker. But I already picked all the habanadas, so we're going to grab some of these. Um, and I'm going to leave a good deal on, of them on here. 
I don't know, that one's starting to get a little rotty and I don't know. Well, we're gonna pick some of them. I already put about eight in there. So there's the habanadas and the sugar rush peaches and I think together those are gonna make a really awesome hot sauce. I may play around and put some citrus in it too. All right. It is hot outside. Feels good in here. So here is my pizza dough. Looking lovely. And this is actually my second batch of pizza dough because I was nervous about putting that much in the mixer. Oh, pizza night's kind of an ordeal around here. We actually have some friends coming over and we have our little pizza oven and it makes really good pizza, but I like to get all the toppings and make personalized pizzas for everybody. So that's what I'm gonna be doing here in just a little bit. I'm trying to decide. I'm very overzealous with my time. You may have picked up on this. <laughs> and um, I always say I have way more ideas than I have time. So what happens is, is I'll like pick peppers and I'll be like, I can make hot sauce before I make pizza for dinner and I probably can't. So I'm gonna get my dough rolled out and then we'll see where my time is. I might have to make this hot sauce in the morning after I get the kids up and ready. Habanada peppers, if you guys have never grown these before. This is one of my favorites. Th these make my like must grow pepper list every year. So I like habaneros, but I'm kind of a wimp when it comes to spice. Habanadas, they taste so fruity to me, especially when it's like late in the summer and it's very hot outside. Um, any sort of like fruit, pepper, tomato, anything like that. It's just gonna have more of a pronounced flavor in the heat. That's why I, I joked about my rotten tomato walls. That's why those are still there because they're sickly, they're not producing that much. It's really too hot for tomatoes to set blossoms. Um, but the tomatoes that are on those plants, you're just never gonna experience that fruit. All of the big fruit, like the slicers, they're pretty well petered out but the cherries are still producing some or ripening what was on there and oh my goodness i say that store-bought tomatoes taste like disappointment and that's true and garden tomatoes to me never taste like disappointment they can't i guess they could be slightly disappointing if you're watering them just a ton and uh, you know they don't have super pronounced flavor but i will say that like an a tomato on the vine in late august in the heat of the summer, even if the plant is sickly, even if the tomato is not the prettiest tomato, it is an experience. <laughs> Truly, like the best tomatoes I've ever eaten in my life are from their late fruits. And that is why I've not pulled those plants out yet. It's not because they're prolific. It's not because there's, I mean, hardly any of those are even getting picked and brought in the house at this point. Like there are so few of them. But going out there, like today, at the end of a very hot afternoon, I probably just ate 20 cherry tomatoes, but I'm still gonna eat pizza for dinner. They're just so good. Y'all know I really like to share with you when I screw things up because sometimes I read comments that I actually don't think that I'm like fooling a lot of people. I think most of you know that I'm actually incredibly flawed as a human, but like sometimes I read comments where I feel like people have a very unhealthy view of what's going on over here. So sometimes I just kind of have to laugh. So like this dough right here in this tub. So this is the dough that I mixed first while my kids were working on some schoolwork and asking me a lot of questions. And it's always when I'm counting in my head that my children ask me like deep theological questions. <laughs> like, it's always in that moment where I'm like trying to like multiply tripling this recipe. I'm measuring in grams. I'm doing all this. And then all of a sudden they, you know, they, they want to know like very deep things that I'm glad they're asking and I want to validate but also like I don't want to mess up the dough and basically I made this whole triple batch of dough before I realized because I have like a few different recipes which are like ratios of moisture to flour and all that stuff and this and I should have known it because it has a very menial amount of yeast in it and it's a slow rise dough it takes 24 hours and um I wasn't really paying attention until I got it all mixed. And then I was handling it after I mixed it and I was like, this doesn't feel right. 
and I started thinking like at that point it was quiet my kids were out of the room and like I started thinking about it and I was like mmm that was not enough yeast for this so I've got this dough I set it aside I think what I'm gonna do is portion it and wrap it and freeze it as it is and then that way next time I want to make pizza I should be able to like thaw it out and let it rise hey Ash what's up man you want to say hi to Asher Asher you want to say hi to our YouTube friends hey. say hi isn't Asher so handsome? He just started 10th grade. Asher puts his robe on when he gets home. He has since he was very little. Home is for robes, right, Ash? Yeah. I love you. Love you too. <laughs> so here is my pizza dough take two. A friend's coming over for dinner and you're making pizza. If you don't have the dough, you don't have dinner. And so I was like, I could try to mix more stuff in there, but I'm not 100% sure it would work right. So I'm just gonna leave that, freeze it, and try again. Because that's life, man. Sometimes you just gotta do that. Asher. With his cat. He's so magical. <laughs> it's the next morning. Here's a gratuitous elephant ear shot. Y'all, you see this? The way the droplets of water get on these. It's the little things in life. <laughs> I love these. I've had some people tell me that um, where they live colocaceas like that are incredibly invasive here it freezes so they die back but those are huge those are very beautiful katie girl are you zoomy are you zoomy katie <laughs> katie gets very zoomy in the morning we're actually gonna we're actually gonna walk over here into the woods real quick check on mama pig um i've been checking on her every morning and then you know, sometime in the middle of the day and then in the evening. Um, just, she seems very close, but she was in with the boar for a couple of months. So the window of when she could be due is pretty large. I'm not sure that she's overdue. I just know she's getting close. All right. Bless her heart. You don't see her laying there. She was just like, had her head up drinking out of that barrel while laying down. I, um do commiserate with that season of pregnancy. Hey big mama. What you got going on there? This is her first time farrowing. I mean obviously you want to keep a close eye on your animals anytime they're going to go through something like birth because it is a big deal but um, you know especially when you have a first time mom um, you just don't know what kind of mom they're going to be. You don't know if they're going to be a good one and um Instincts have a lot to do with it, lineage has a lot to do with it, and this pig came from our friends in Arkansas VW Family Farm, and she came from a good mom that had lots of babies and took care of them. So I have very high hopes for her. I think that she's going to do well. I'm really looking for her to balloon up, like with her milk coming in. That's really whenever you know that it's time. She's looking more and more, you know, full every day. But she hasn't quite hit that mark that I know it's going to be any minute. Hey, girl. We're rooting for you, girly. Rooting for you. Little, little pig humor. <laughs> She's like, you made me get up and you didn't even bring me anything to eat. You know, there's some sort of... Uh, melon or cucumber seeds growing out here we've been moving these mobile pens around under this tree canopy because it's hot and um keeping the pigs in the shade just makes it more comfortable for them but they get the garden scraps now i don't know how well stuff will grow out here because of it being so shaded um but i wouldn't be surprised if next spring this area is just completely full of garden food like it because of the pigs i've shared a lot of times that the gardens that grow the volunteer gardens that grow in pig pens is what makes me willing to try anything in the garden because it was the thing that kind of impressed upon me how much seeds just want to grow how much 
uh, these plants want to reproduce. When I look at the garden and I look at stuff like plants that come up from pig poop, it isn't rocket science. It's, it's just a, a doable thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be exactly, you know, by the books. A lot of times it grows anyway. I've never found a seed starting book that says feed the seeds to a pig and let them digest them and poop them out and then you know you'll you'll get plants from it but here we are i love this vantage point of the farm isn't that lovely yeah look here's some tomatoes closer over that's funny i wonder how many things are out here there's something right there that's some sort of cucumber or melon that's a ground cherry what a lovely thing to be a gardener when things so desperately want to grow thank you guys for hanging out with me today i bless you until next time